Hello, I'm Lee Veris. I've been a commercial photographer for over 40 years, working in the entertainment advertising industry. Today I'm going to be talking about how the mirrorless camera systems are changing the way photographers approach the photo workflow, and I'm going to examine ways to utilize the in-camera picture styles to inform your creative vision. Now, what I'm talking about here can apply to many mirrorless cameras, but I am most excited about the Fuji X system cameras, and specifically Fuji's latest camera, the X-Pro2, which I feel is the ultimate expression of the mirrorless approach to photography today. And I'm going to be spending a bit of time with the Q button on the back of the Fuji X cameras, and its use in quickly accessing in-camera creative controls. The mirrorless cameras have changed the photographic workflow in a way that integrates the three areas of pre-visualization, capture, and realization by introducing the electronic viewfinder. This provides us with the opportunity for a what-you-see-is-what-you-get experience of capturing images. You don't need to check the back to verify that you got the shot because you can now see it when you take it. This to me is the essence of the mirrorless revolution and we will be exploring how to use this to our creative advantage. I am not going to discuss the notion that JPEGs are bad. You can see all about how JPEGs are not bad in my other video, Rethinking the RAW File Workflow. Today I'm going to look at Fuji's film simulations and shooting modes as creative ways to craft the image in camera, and how that can impact your creative vision. Fuji calls their versions of picture styles film simulations, and they have a bunch of them. With Provia, which is like standard, Velvia, kind of like vivid, Astia, which is a soft contrast style, uh, classic chrome, uh, Proneg High, Proneg Standard, Acros, which is the new black and white film simulation in a yellow, red, and green filter uh, mode. We have monochrome and the requisite sepia. Now each one of these represents a noticeably different look and combined with the other shoot mode controls give you a lot of control over the look of the image. So first let's take a look at how film simulations affect the rendering of the image in the EVF. Here's Provia Standard. This is Fuji's version of Standard. Suited to a wide range of subjects from portraits to landscapes. This is the default film simulation. And if you don't change any preferences, this is what you'll see in the EVF. This is Velvia. It's based on Fuji's famous slide film emulsion, a high contrast palette of saturated colors suited to nature photos. This has extra saturation in greens, blues, and reds, and it's perfect for landscapes. Astia Soft. This enhances the ranges of hues available for skin tones and portraits, while preserving the bright, bright blues of daylight skies. It's recommended for outdoor portraits. This simulation renders very smooth color in the skin, and it's ideal for most portraits, but it also works very well for blue hour landscape photos. Classic Chrome. Fuji says this has soft color and enhanced shadow contrast for a calm look, whatever that means. I think this is meant to simulate older professional slide film. It's not as saturated as Velvia, and blues shift a little towards cyan, and it has more contrast. It's a little bit darker in the shadows. Uh, Proneg High offers slightly more contrast than Proneg Standard. It's recommended for outdoor portrait photography. Uh, a little less colorful than Astia. This is a good color neutral rendering simulation that I think of as an alternative to Provia. It's just a little bit less colorful with good contrast. Proneg Standard. This is a soft tone palette. The range of hues available for skin tones is enhanced, making this a good choice for studio portraits. It's a bit flatter than Proneg High. Uh, it doesn't have the bright blues that Astia has, uh, but it is similar in contrast and maybe a little, little less colorful overall. I used to set my X-Pro1 to this setting just to view the image when shooting raw because I wanted a soft rendering to see as much potential detail as possible. I found that I had the tendency to underexpose a bit when I relied on the viewfinder for quick exposure judgments because the shadow values were so open. I started using Velvia, the most contrasting viewing mode, to compensate for this tendency. Now that I'm shooting with the X-Pro2, 
I'm actually changing the film simulations to suit the scene, and I've really adapted to judging the exposure perfectly based on what I see in the viewfinder. I never bother to look at the histogram anymore. Acros. This is based on an old Fuji black and white film, and it takes black and white photos with rich gradation and outstanding sharpness. It also has a subtle film grain simulation built in. It's available with yellow, red, and green filters. And these filters are meant to replicate uh, what would happen if you actually put a glass filter over the lens. Here's the requisite sepia simulation. Everybody has a sepia, and I never find any sepia simulations to be particularly good. Uh, I find this one to just sort of be dull and unattractive. I'd rather take the Acros black and white and add the tone in Lightroom later. Uh, in addition to the film simulations, you have additional control over the rendered image by taking advantage of Fuji's, Fuji's shooting modes. These are image size and quality, uh, film simulation, grain effect, dynamic range, white balance, highlight tone and shadow tone, color, sharpness, and noise reductions. Now some of these are fairly obvious and we've seen a little bit about film simulations, but dynamic range and highlight and shadow tone deserve a little more explanation. So dynamic range is a setting for overall contrast. 100% is normal, and 200 and 400% are softer. When you set your range to auto, it will change from 100% to 200% when you select an ISO above 400. If you manually select 200 or 400, you won't be able to use the softer rendering below the cutoff ISOs of 400 and 800, respectively. Uh, in practice, I keep the dynamic range set at 400% and my ISO at 800 most of the time, just to ensure lower contrast for low light situations, which tend to be more contrasty. And it always kicks back down to 100% when I go back down to ISO 200 native ISO of the Fuji X cameras. Highlight tone is a contrast setting for highlights. It goes from minus 4 to plus 4 with 0 being normal. Minus settings move the highlights darker as expected, reducing the contrast. Shadow tone, however, uses the same values, perhaps counterintuitively, in the same way so that minus settings are softer moving the shadow values lighter, so minus equals lighter for the shadow tone. Things get much more interesting when we add shadow tone and highlight tone adjustments to the film simulations in camera. These tone controls are not that easily replicated in, in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom using the shadow and highlight sliders. They just look subtly different. Here's a shot of my wife, the mistress of light, Bobby Lane using Velvia with the highlight and shadow tone set to zero. It's kind of normal. By adding plus setting to both highlight and shadow tone, we get a global increase in contrast. Going plus two, plus three, and plus four. It's super contrasty. Now, if we leave the highlight tone where it is and drop the shadow tone to lower contrast and lighter values, minus two, and now you can see how cleanly the shadows transition even after a huge change. Here's a setting I like, and it's really hard to get something that exactly matches this in Lightroom. It seems that Fuji is doing two things simultaneously in its shadow and highlight tone. It decreasing the contrast and moving the values closer to the middle or making the shadow values lighter uh, in its minus setting and increasing the contrast as well as moving values away from the middle. So making the shadows darker and the highlights lighter in its plus setting. But it keeps the local regions of highlight and shadow isolated from each other uh, while controlling the local contrast in those regions. In this case, I have slightly higher, lighter highlights with a little more contrast and much lighter shadows with less contrast, making her hair seem softer but with crisper details in her scarf. Okay, so how do we really use all this creatively? The Fuji X cameras have f-stops on the lens, shutter speeds and ISO on the dial on top, and this handy little exposure compensation dial. The retro design of the Fuji cameras just feels really comfortable for an old film camera user like myself. 
Now these controls, along with the Q button, make using the Fuji cameras easy in a powerful and creative way because you can see the results of all the setting changes in the EVF. Here's a simple example of how this works. This is how this particular scene looked to the naked eye. If I had seen it like this in the viewfinder, I might have decided that the man in the red shirt in the background was a little too distracting and I might have tried to move uh, to eliminate those men in the background and I might have missed this great unposed moment. But this is what I saw in the viewfinder. Clearly, shooting in black and white affects the way you see the scene and it becomes much more part of the moment of capture. The notion of pre-visualization goes away and becomes simply seeing the shot. This has had a huge impact on my photography. To use the in-camera rendering shoot modes, all you have to do is hit the Q button and it will, it will present a screen where you can access all of the shoot mode parameters in one screen. Once you get used to it, it's very quick to hit the Q button and then navigate the screen with this little joystick or the navigation buttons, and then use the wheel to set any item you'd like to change on the fly. Everything is right under your thumb. With the custom setting highlighted, as you see here, turning the wheel on the back of the camera allows you to change from one set of presets to the next. It's a whole collection of custom presets. So we, we have, as I change, it, it'll change all of the presets for this custom setting. Here's custom five, six, and finally, a total of seven preset collections of settings. If the mechanical dial or switches are set to something other than where they were in the original custom setting, they will be highlighted in yellow, as you can see here. In this case, the focus switch was set to manual focus, and the ISO, ISO dial is set to something less than 800 ISO, which is where I had it for the original preset. If you change any of the other settings on the screen and then re-enter the screen, pushing the Q button again, you will see the preset name with base amended, as shown here. In this case, I had changed the highlight tone to plus one. This just alerts you that something has changed from the saved preset. The settings are sticky, so they don't automatically revert to the saved preset. You'll notice that whenever you highlight another setting, the title at the top of the screen changes to reflect the parameter you're about to change. So let's look at some more examples of all this in action. This one is shot in the Chihuly Garden and Glass Museum in Seattle. I wanted to emphasize the vibrant red of the sculpture, so Velvia is an obvious choice. The sculpture had strong spotlights hitting it, and the reflective glass was really glowing. Changing the highlight tone to minus two allowed me to keep detail in the highlights and ensured that I exposed high enough to get the right amount of shadow detail. Remember, I can see all this happen in the EVF on the fly. Working this way with the camera causes me to slow down and be more involved with crafting the image while I'm capturing it. When I see how deep the shadows are and how black areas interact with other elements, it affects how I explore the subject camera. This image was captured with Velvia, an already contrasting film simulation, combined with a plus two setting for the shadow tone, and it gave me these very deep black shadows that isolated the red glass sculpture against the green leaves. Here's another example of the shadow tone control. This is Bobby again, shot with the Acros black and white film simulation and a shadow tone setting of plus three. And here's the same shot with a setting of zero. Now I can see all this change in the EVF, and if I have the opportunity and a patient subject, I can take a little more time to get the result I'm looking for and shoot more using the same settings with other images. So to really take advantage of this new way of creatively seeing like the camera, you need to set up your camera to shoot RAW plus JPEG, even if you insist on processing the RAW files. If you only shoot RAW files, you will see the effect of the camera setting in the EVF, but you will have no reference for what you saw recorded in the RAW file. You have to apply those presets later when you get into Lightroom. It's sort of like reinventing the wheel, so save yourself the trouble and import the JPEGs as well as the RAW. Then at very least you have a visual reference for what inspired you in the first place. 
here again is Acros. Uh, when combined with a minus two highlight tone, it gives you very subtle differentiation in highlight values. This and the following images were captured at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Beautiful highlights. And this is exactly what I saw through the viewfinder. If you find a scene you want more contrast, hit the Q button and dial up the shadow tone to get darker blacks. You can see the difference in the viewfinder. Here the shadow tone at plus two dropped the background down to almost black and the highlight tone at minus two preserved the subtle gradations in the flower, that which, is, which was in direct sunlight. Here's a plus two shadow tone, and it creates very deep shadow tones for a dramatic rendering. This scene was all white marble and had a much lower contrast appearance to the eye. With Acros and a plus three shadow tone, the shadows got a lot deeper with extra impact. The highlight tone was set at minus two to put more detail in the bright white marble. I went on a boat tour around Manhattan recently, around sunset. This is a really beautiful way to get great shots of the New York skyline. The light was a little hazy, and I was using Velvia with a shadow tone plus one to try and cut through the haze a little bit. But then I thought, well, what would happen if I enhanced the haze? So I set the highlight and shadow tone to minus two, and interesting things started to happen. I could lower the exposure just a little and dial up the color just a little to plus one, and the city took on a kind of a glow. Switching to black and white, Acros R, red filter simulation, it puts more detail into the sky. And I saw this dramatically dark rendering that showed off the glint of the sun in the windows. You, I'm always working the exposure compensation dial, just rocking it around when I'm taking a picture. So I got this kind of look, and then later in Photoshop, I took this black and white and blended it back into the color from the RAW file and ended up with this. Sometimes shooting in black and white lets us see things we might have missed in a regular color scene. Again, while I was in black and white, I shot a lot of silhouettes looking into the sun. But as we approached this bridge, I thought, what if I really opened up and went for a softer rendering? Setting the highlight and shadow tone to minus two, I saw this and captured a bunch of images this way. Later on in Lightroom, I thought, you know, why not really push the hazy, dreamy look? So I used the dehaze slider uh, to add haze with a minus slider setting. I then blended it back into the sharper original so that only the skyline was fogged. And this really pushed the more distant buildings back. You can see here that I'm not advocating that it is unnecessary to use post-processing to enhance your images. But setting up the camera a certain way allowed me to recognize a creative interpretation at the time I was capturing. And this is very important. It provides a sort of creative feedback loop that enhances the photographic process. Now you've probably noticed that I have several shots here processed in different ways. This is because the Fuji cameras are capable of processing RAW files in camera after the capture. At any time after shooting, if you shoot RAW plus JPEG, you can come back and reprocess any number of variations. When you are playing back an image, you press the Q button, and then you get a menu of all the shooting mode settings so that you can change to set up a new rendering. You hit Q again, and you can save this new JPEG right to the card. So hit the Q button while playing, and you get a menu that lets you change just about any parameter, and including a kind of push-pull setting for exposure adjustment. It goes from minus 2 EV to plus 3 EV. Now, frankly, I don't actually find much use for this, because with EVS showing such a good preview, you should be able to tell if you have a good exposure before you take the picture. In my practice, I might do an on-the-spot variation of film simulation, highlight, or shadow tone to decide how I want to shoot the rest of the shots in a given situation. If you hit the display back button while you are playing an image, you can get an info display that shows you all of the settings used for that particular image, so you can decide what to change for the new version. You can use this feature to explore options at the shoot. And once you've settled on a look that you want, you can shoot the rest of the images the same way. You no longer have to wait till you get back home to try out variations. 
some more examples. Asti is particularly good with blue hour photos. This is a shot from our recent visit to Oman, and it's the Royal Opera House in Muscat. I put the highlight tone at minus two. This kept the contrast and the light sources down and allowed me to increase the exposure just a little bit to get some detail in the silhouetted figures. I also dialed the color up to plus two to get more saturation. It's a contrasty scene with a lot of direct light sources. This is inside the opera house. It's a multi-shot panorama stitched together in Photoshop. The Astia soft uh, rendering with highlight shadow tone at minus two allowed for a beautiful rendering of the interior of this building. Acros, it's obvious aid for visualizing black and white. And when combined with highlight and shadow tone, you can really craft the look of the image while you see it. This was a fairly flat scene, lighting-wise. I did do some Lightroom local adjustments to knock back the contrast in the background even more, so the foreground figure would pop a little bit. Highlight tone was set at minus two, just to get those creamy highlights, and the shadow tone was set at plus two to get a little more punch in the dark shadows. Shot in the fish market in Muscat, Oman. This guy looks a little grumpy because nobody's talking to him about his fish. The people in it were incredibly friendly in Oman. This was shot with a highlight tone at minus two and a shadow tone at plus two. The X stands for, you guessed it, Fuji X. In the studio, I tend to keep the shadow and highlight tone zeroed out and just control the contrast with lighting. In this particular shot, I did change the shadow tone to minus one, just to open up the unlit shadows a tiny bit, but I ended up putting back a little more contrast with the clarity slider in Lightroom to fine tune it. A few more examples from New York. Here's the Statue of Liberty. It's Velvia with highlight and shadow tone at minus two, and uh, contrast boost in Lightroom with the clarity slider. I'm finding that very often, a little plus clarity is all I need to do Here, a fireboat approaches with a display of the water cannons. Velvia, highlight tone at minus two, shadow tone at zero, little plus clarity in Lightroom. Finally, the scene with the fireboat in front of the statue catching the last rays of the sun in a beautiful impressionistic display. Velvia with highlight and shadow tone at minus two, plus a little Photoshop color enhancing in LAB to bring out the magenta hues. Okay, so for review, mirrorless is the way to go for several reasons. The EVF offers the real ability to see exactly what you're getting before you press the shutter. This means you are seeing the shot, not just pre-visualizing through a viewfinder. JPEGs are not bad. In fact, they can be your ally in creative image creation. Fuji's film simulations rock, and the shoot modes of dynamic range and highlight shadow tone offer a lot of control over the look of the image, which you can use at the time of the shoot or afterwards by reprocessing in the camera. This does take some practice to gain authority with the image in the viewfinder. We just haven't been used to really judging the quality of the image by what we see in the viewfinder. You have to force yourself to slow down and try to get the image to look the way you want. I find that this has the ancillary benefit of making me see better, and it's improved my photography. I'd like to thank Fuji for creating such great photo creation tools. There's a lot more to their system than just the film simulation modes, and uh, we didn't talk about the X-Trend sensor, the lack of low-pass filter, or the incredibly high-quality optics, or any of the other great camera models. So, be sure and check them out. If you are already using another mirrorless system, try the picture styles for in-camera JPEGs or simply for changing the way you see the scene. You may find that it enhances your ability to see creatively. I have a friend, David Michael Kennedy, who is a great fine art photographer making platinum palladium prints. He used to shoot with a Leica rangefinder with black and white film. Now he's using a Sony A7R shooting RAW with the black and white view in his viewfinder and using his Leica lenses and he is loving the fact that he now sees in black and white. So even if you don't end up using JPEGs, you can use the EVF to inform your vision. Be sure and check out my blog, my YouTube channel, and connect with me on social media. 
Thanks, everybody.